It's time for us to start our class, or rather a couple of minutes past. We're going to continue into our, our study of Romans this morning. We, we finished up chapter 8 last week, so we'll be beginning uh, chapter 9 of, uh, of Romans. We ended up a major section of the book and what Paul has been doing up to this point, just to kind of give a little bit of a review just very quickly. First few chapters, the first three chapters, he, he convicts everyone of sin, whether you're Jew, Gentile, regardless of your background, regardless of, of who you are, everyone has sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We can't earn our way to a righteous standing with, before God. The law can't do anything to save. It only brings awareness or knowledge of sin. And then he states at the end of chapter 3, we maintain that a man is justified by faith in Christ apart from works of the law, that justification or being counted righteous, having a good standing before God, comes through putting our faith or our trust in Jesus. And he proves that in chapter 4 by looking mainly at Abraham and also briefly at David. We saw when we got to chapter 6 uh, how one puts faith in Christ, or rather the response of faith, that when we're baptized into Christ, we're united with Christ, we're freed from sin at that point. We saw in chapter 7 the futility of trying to keep the law or trying to earn a righteous standing before God through the law. And then last week in chapter, or the last several weeks rather, in chapter 8, we talked about how there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Uh, we looked at how the Spirit helps us in Christ. And then we talked about how there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. And now we get into chapters 9 through 11, which are some of the most difficult in the book to understand. And so we'll be working our way through those. It'll take us several weeks to get through these chapters, and it is a specific section that is uh, where Paul is addressing an issue for the Jews. And so we're going to see some kind of difficult and heavy subject matter come up in these chapters. Uh, it deals with how the teaching of justification by faith in Christ relates to the covenants that God made with the Jews, specifically dealing with the covenant that was made at Sinai, the law of Moses. How does that relate? Because Israel had been given some incredible promises, but many of the Jews weren't enjoying the blessings of God because they didn't have faith in Jesus. And so there's some objections that the Jews are going to have to, you know, is, have God's promises failed? Is God trustworthy? And so Paul is going to address some of those types of things, a specific Jewish issue. But before we get into our class time this morning, let's bow and begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for the time that we have to spend in your word this morning. Father, your, your word is perfect. It, uh, it lights our path, Father. It tells us who you are and it tells us who you've called us to be, Father. And I pray that as we look into the book of Romans, that it would help us to understand more of what you expect out of us, and Father, that it would help our faith in you to grow. Father, I pray that we would not just hear what's in your word, but Father, that we would take it and apply it. And Father, ultimately, that I pray that the way that we live each day would uh, be more and more like Jesus as a result of what we study here. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. And so Israel's been given some incredible promises, as I mentioned. But a lot of the Jews, many of the Jews, or rather most of the Jews, are not enjoying the blessings of God because they don't have faith in Jesus. Now Paul has already touched on the why of this, and we're going to look at this pretty repeatedly as we go through this section. In chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, he says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and its praise is not from men, but from God. And the idea being that it's about the, it's about the right heart. It's about having faith. And so all the way through this book, one of the things that you see being answered, and we'll see this especially when we get in a week or two, when we get to a section of chapter 10, one of the, the, the main questions that Paul sets out to answer in this book is who do you trust to save you? Are you trusting yourself or are you trusting Jesus? And so we're going to see, and we'll see that as I mentioned, as we progress through this section of the text, but that's one of the main things that we see. Now, before we get into this part of the text, one of the key things to remember as we go through chapters 9 and 10 and 11, he's dealing with Jews. He's dealing with their way of thinking. He's dealing with a problem that was going on there in first century Rome with Christians of a Jewish background, and so their way of thinking is a little bit removed from 21st century American way of thinking. 
And so some of the things here are a little bit, maybe a little bit difficult for us to follow the way that they reasoned, the way that they thought. Uh, we'll do our best as we work our way through this. But one of the key things to remember as we go through this section is what Paul says there in chapter 9 and verse 6. They are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. One of the key questions that comes up in these three chapters is, who is true Israel? Who is, we call it, spiritual Israel? And we're going to see that addressed as we work our way through these chapters. Uh, Denny? As we get farther into this, I appreciate what he's written in chapter 8. It talks about choices things that you have to make. The word if is used so many times in there. There are choices that have to be made and changes in your life. Now that not only applies to the Jews that he's talking to here, but it also applies to, to Gentiles as they watch what the Jews are going through, as they, they try to find out who they are. So in chapter eight, it says, if you make these choices, then what will happen when you do that, you see at the end of chapter eight and going on into chapter nine, but first you have to make those choices and changes. Yes, as Christians, we have to choose to be led by the Spirit of God. And you saw, as Denny's mentioning there, especially, I think you see there in verses 12 through 17 of chapter 8, that as children of God, we have an obligation to live by the Spirit of God. It has an implication for how we live each day. And that's a daily decision that we make. But what we're dealing with in chapter 9 largely is, to a degree, there's some misunderstanding by the Jews. There's also the, you know, they're having a difficulty getting their head around why are we not right with God? We've kept the law, we've kept the commandments, we've kept the, the feast days and the festivals and all of these different things. They've gone through all the rituals, but is that really what God's interested in? Now we know that He gave the commands for that. We see that in the law. But what He was looking for is the heart behind it. He wanted them to go through the right motions, of course, but it was about so much more than that. What He's looking for is the heart. And what we're seeing here is he's looking for the heart that will trust him, who will put faith in Jesus. What makes this section so difficult? It deals with a first century problem that specifically we don't face today. Now there's some application. But the specific issue between Jew and Gentile is kind of foreign to us as far as what's going on here. Paul tailored his approach to the Jewish way of thinking, which is different than our way of thinking. And this section, chapters 9 and 10 and 11, have also been a source of several false teachings from those who misunderstand what's going on here. And so we'll address those as we come up to them uh, as well. But in chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 1. He says, I'm telling the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption as sons, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and, uh, and the temple service and the promises. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. And so we have the first five verses here. And as I mentioned for the first eight chapters of the book, Paul has emphasized that no one is justified through keeping the law. And this would have gotten Paul very likely labeled a traitor by these Jews. What do you mean nobody's saved through keeping the law? But this section will show that he loves and is deeply concerned with them. And we see there at the beginning, Paul has a great sorrow over the fact that most of the Jews have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And as a result aren't justified. They aren't counted righteous because they don't trust Jesus. And so you see you know, here he's talking about the great sorrow and unceasing grief that he has because of their uh, spiritual situation. Because they haven't come to an understanding, an accurate understanding of who Jesus is. In verse 3, you see the level of love, the, the, the amount of love that, that Paul has for, his, uh, for the Jews. He says, I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. In other words, he's saying if, if it would bring them to a correct knowledge, if it would bring them to being saved, he said, I would give mine up. I would give up my salvation for them. What an incredible statement that he makes there. And he used there, he says, specifically, he says, I wish that I were accursed, or the Greek term 
anathema, it term, this term refers to a person who is excluded from God's people and condemned. You see, this, this is the same term that Paul uses over in Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9, when he's just, you know, it sounds like, you know, just furiously writing about the fact that they've turned away from the truth of the gospel. In Galatians 1, 8 and 9, he says, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we've said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Paul is willing to go to the greatest extent to see to it that if there's any way that he can bring his people, that he could bring the Jews to salvation, that he could bring them to Jesus. And so we see the depth of love that he has for his people in what he says there. In verses 4 and 5, he gets into the advantages that the Jew has. Now, in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he had briefly mentioned the advantage that the Jews have. He says, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And so he's talked about the advantage the Jew has there. But here Paul kind of expands that list in speaking of the blessings that the Jews had. And he gives you know, quite the list here. He says they're Israelites. And that would refer to their being a descendant of Jacob or being descendants of Jacob. That's a, a, something that held a special significance to them, that name, Israelite. They trace that back to their, through their history. They possess the adoption as sons. It emphasizes that God had chosen them from among everyone else in the world. And you see that the way that God speaks to the Israelites in the Old Testament. You from among all the nations are mine, my chosen people. And you see that in a couple of spots in Exodus. In Exodus chapter 4, specifically verse 22. Verses 21 and 22 of Exodus 4 says, The Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt... See that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power, and I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And so he's talking about here, Paul is, is making a reference to the Israelites. It belongs to the adoption as sons. And there are other places in, in, in throughout the Old Testament that use that same kind of terminology as well. To them is, they are Israelites. They possess the adoption of sons. He talks about here the glory in verse 4. And the glory very likely refers to the presence of God among His people. That God dwelt in the midst of His people. You remember whenever they set up camp, they had the tabernacle there in the very center of the camp. Right in the middle of the people. Only Israel was honored in this way among all the nations to have God's very presence right there with them. The covenants, and there are several throughout the, you know, the Old Testament that are mentioned. There's the, the covenant, a couple of the specific ones, the covenant that God had made with Abraham to your descendants, I've given this land. The covenant of circumcision that you see in Genesis 17. But then specifically, the covenant that was made with the Israelites at Mount Sinai. The covenants. The giving of the law, as we mentioned in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the possession of the law was a great advantage that they possessed and that they had word directly from God to tell them how they were to live, to tell them what God expected, how they could be holy, how they could be what He wanted. They had a direct revelation from God in the law. The temple service, he mentions here, they had access to God like no other nation, like no other people that they could come to the temple, they could, they could have access to God uh, in that way. The promises he mentions, there are promises made throughout the Old Testament, especially those concerning the Messiah come to mind. The fathers, the Jews were proud of their ancestry. Specifically, this would refer to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he says here, the Christ according to the flesh, that God had used the Jews to bring Jesus into the world. Here's where Paul talks about it. And he really lays out, here are the, the advantages 
that the Jews have. Here are the blessings that the Jews have. And he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart because these people that God has blessed so tremendously, that God has given so much to, the vast majority of them don't believe in Jesus. And so that starts off, here's the, the beginning of this section as he's dealing with this Jewish problem. Here's the situation that they found themselves in. And so we continue on from there. We'll pick up in verse 6. And I'll read down through uh, verse 13 where we talk about God's sovereignty. Because what we're going to see in this next section, through, uh, really through chapter 9, is this idea of God making choices. And what we're going to see through the rest of chapter 9 is, the, is that God is just in the choices that He makes. And we're going to see how, how Paul shows, you know, God made this choice and the Jews would say, yes, of course, and He made this choice and He made this choice and the Jews are all going to agree. So is He not just in choosing those who believe over those who disbelieve? And so he, he reasons this to a conclusion, but we see God's sovereignty here in this section. He said, It is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Nor are they all children because they're Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but children of the promise are regarded as descendants. But this is the word of promise. At that time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also. And when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not yet done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to His choice would stand, not because of works, but because of Him who calls. It was said to her, The older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And so we have God's sovereignty in how He chooses, how He's going to carry things out. It's not as though the Word of God has failed. He starts off in verse 6. An anticipated objection from the Jews. Paul's just spoken about the covenants that God made with the Jews as being one of the blessings. You've got the covenants. You've got the Word of God. You've got all of these things. And what are the Jews going to say? Well, what good is that? Look back at the first eight chapters of what you wrote, Paul. What good is all of that? And Paul is saying, Word of God has not failed at all. Throughout the letter, he's been insisting that justification comes by faith in Jesus rather than on the basis of law. And so the Jews would, because of their background, would likely object to what he's been saying or accuse Paul of saying that the Word of God has failed. And he's saying here it absolutely hasn't. Since most of the Jews don't believe in Jesus, then doesn't that imply that Paul's teaching that God's promises have failed is essentially the argument that Paul is getting ready to answer. And he's saying absolutely not. The Word of God has not failed in the slightest. Because what he says there at the end of that verse, they are not all Israel who are from Israel. A distinction has to be made between those who are physical descendants and those who are actually of faith, of the faith of Abraham, those who are true Israel. And we already read chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, where he mentions that being a true Jew is about the inward man, about the heart. It's not about just one's ancestors who you can trace your lineage back to. You know, it reminds me in Luke chapter 3 of John the Baptist when he's got all the area of Judea. You've got people coming to him from this entire region. And in uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And don't begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Your ancestry is not what's important, is what he's telling them. Your heart is what's important. JP? Well, Genesis says it in 15, 6, uh, but James also uh, repeats it, that Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. So the definition of... Abraham even coming into contact with that relationship is that belief. It's that core belief that, that sets him aside from everybody else on the planet. And now today gives us that same option. That belief leads to everything else that starts 
that relationship that we can have with Christ. That's it. And that's exactly as we've seen earlier on in Romans, he made that point specifically in chapter 4 of Romans, that it was, with, even with Abraham, it wasn't about how he had earned it or he had something to boast about before God. It was Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And you see that same thing to that same point over in Galatians, at the end of Galatians 3. Galatians 3, beginning in verse 26, he says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to promise. Abraham's descendants, how? Verse 26, by faith. And as we've seen, at what point does that faith, is that faith credited as righteousness? When it prompts us to respond to him. For all of you who have been baptized into Christ, to clothe yourselves with Christ. And so you have there, it's being of the faith of Abraham. And you see that demonstrated in that when God told Abraham, I want you to get up and leave your father's house in your country, he got up, Hebrews 11 says, not knowing where he was going. He obeyed. You see the kind of faith. And it's the same kind of faith that God is looking for in His people today. It's that faith that's credited as righteousness. Being a true Jew, he's pointing out to them, is about the inward man, about the heart. It's not just about being able to trace your lineage back to a specific person. God's always been looking for the heart. In Deuteronomy 10, 16, he told them, Circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. In Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 4, he says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart. And in Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26, he talks about them being circumcised and yet uncircumcised. All of the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart, he says. That's what God is really after here, the inward man. In other words, just because you have the right ancestors doesn't mean that you're in a right relationship with God. Your parents' faith, your grandparents' faith, your great-grandparents' faith, any one of those or all of them combined won't get you into heaven. Do you trust in Jesus Christ? They're not all Israel who are descended from Israel. In other words, they're not all faithful. Nor are they all children because they're Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it's not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At that time I'll come and Sarah will have a son. Paul establishes this point by showing that God has always chosen specific individuals to carry out His purpose. He chose specific descendants of Abraham, but not all. Because you say Abraham had a number of children. After Sarah died, he married Keturah, which is recorded in Genesis 25. And Genesis 25 verses 1 and 2 gives a list of children that Abraham had. He also had Ishmael. But it's the children of the promise that God chose. The children of the promised child, that is Isaac. Oh, we got a hand up here at the front, J.P., well, in Jesus himself, Matthew 7, 21, not all who say, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. The Lord himself said it, that there's, that there's a boundary with all of that, and you have to know what that boundary is. Yes, and so just because someone claims that Jesus is Lord, does that claim, is that claim backed up by how they live? Yeah. Are they actually living as Je with Jesus as their Lord and their master? Are we giving Jesus decision-making authority in our lives? That when something difficult comes up, do we look at this and go, okay, what would the Lord want me to do, not what do I want to do here? Does He have the authority to affect and to ultimately override our desires in making decisions, even big decisions, especially big decisions? Is He the Lord or is He not? But Abraham had a number of children. We read that in Genesis 25 and Genesis 16. We read about how he also had Ishmael. The children of promise didn't come through any of these. They came through Isaac. And Paul quotes from Genesis 18, uh, 10 here to make this point. And a year later, God fulfilled the promise that Isaac would be born. 
God chose uh, who would be the children of promise. The implication is that God has the right to decide who His people are even within physical Israel. God chose this one, not this one. And that's the point that Paul is, is building up here. Who within physical Israel is considered to be true Israel is up to God. And that's where we're headed with this. In verses 10 and following, he says, Not only this, but there was also Rebekah, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not yet done anything good or bad, so God's purpose according to his choice, would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it's written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. God chose Jacob over Esau. Now, the objection that the Jews might would have before, well, of course God chose Isaac over Ishmael because, well, he was more righteous or whatever else, you know, whatever other argument they could make. And Paul says, what about Jacob and Esau? The decision was made before they were born. God made the choice, the older will serve the younger. And so whatever argument that the Jews might be able to make, Paul now shuts that down by saying, now look at Jacob and Esau. And so if you're just saying, well, we can trace our descendants back to Abraham, well, the Edomites could do that too. And so he's making the point here that God, of God's sovereignty in his choosing, didn't he? You mentioned that Esau can trace his lineage back to Abraham, and the nation of Islam today makes that statement that their ancestor is Abraham. But they cannot claim Isaac or Jacob. They can only claim Esau. So do you see there the promise made to true Israel of the heart versus Islam? Yes, well, they would, they would trace their lineage back through Ishmael. And they, as you mentioned there, they go back to Abraham as well, but it's not the same. It's not the child of promise. And so what we see here, the promises that were made, what, and the, the point that Paul is reasoning to is in God's sovereignty and God's right to choose those who are of faith, even Gentiles of faith, rather than those who are unfaithful. So it's, he's, you know, where we're headed in this chapter is that it is just and right for God to choose faithful Gentiles over unfaithful Jews. Because what God is looking for is the heart and those who trust Him. God has the sovereign right to choose who He wants to, and this choosing between Jacob and Esau was done before the twins were born, before they've done anything good or bad. It wasn't about their works, because neither of them had done anything at all. But he says the older will serve the younger. It's a matter of history that the Edomites served, Israel, served the Israelites during the time of King David. In 2 Samuel chapter 8, 13 and 14, it talks about how they served, the Edomites served Israel. The older will serve the younger. You see that played out. In verse 13, you've got a quote from Malachi chapter 1 referring to Edom as a nation. But the whole point that Paul is making here is that God has made choices regarding how He's going to carry out His will, who He's going to bring things about through. And if God had a right to choose Isaac rather than Ishmael and to choose Jacob rather than Esau, then He has a right to choose some Israelites rather than others on the basis of faith. And so He's reasoning from a point that the Jews would all agree with. Well, of course He chose Jacob over Esau. But then they're turning around and they're saying, what do you mean He's choosing the faithful over the unfaithful? He's showing the principle here of God's sovereignty and His right to choose. And God's choosing is just. He brings up in verses 14 down through verse 29. We kind of have a little bit of a long section here. We'll probably get through part of this, and we'll come back and pick it up as well again next week. Uh, Trent? I think it's really important to make the distinction here about what exactly God is choosing between Jacob and Esau because I think there's a lot of, of, a lot of people misconstrue these types of verses if they don't really understand the context and they take it towards um, more of a type of predestination type of thing. So, you know, God chose Jacob over Esau in the way that his plan accorded. He didn't choose Esau to make, these, to make bad choices and to not follow, mm -hmm. not follow his will, right? Mm -hmm. He chose Jacob to be the one that his plan would follow through. 
And, J and Esau had the ability to make the right choices if he wanted to, right? Those choices were still his choices. But, you know, God with the foreknowledge and, it, you know, and being all powerful knew what was going to happen beforehand. So I think that that, that it could be easily misconstrued in a way that, that is not what it's intended for. Yeah, it's not a predestination thing in terms of who's going to be lost and who's going to be saved, but it's talking about God's sovereignty to choose how he's going to carry out his will. And he's reasoning from that to show that God's sovereign in choosing justifying the faithful rather than the unfaithful. He's using the, the logic there, but to your point, you know, he talks about here with G Jacob and Esau, it wasn't about anything good or bad that they'd done. It was about the one who made the choice. Specifically because, as he says, this was before they were even born. But it's about how, who God will use uh, ultimately to bring the Messiah into the world. Whose descendants, where is this nation going to come from? The, the Messiah is going to come through. And in verse 14, he says, What shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. And so we, he continues on here, There's no injustice with God, is there? Well, absolutely not. The question is answering whether it's right or fair for God to choose some Israelites and reject others. Whether it's okay or right or just for God to choose those who are of faith and not those who are unfaithful. There is no injustice with God. In the context of the letter, this could also be questioning whether it's right for God to reject unbelieving Israelites while accepting believing Gentiles. Because you can, you know, you can just imagine the Jews here that well, we're God's people. But there again gets back to Paul's point. It's not about the lineage. It's about the heart. It's about who we trust. And Paul's answer to this question, you know, there's no injustice with God, is there? Is absolutely not. God's completely just, completely righteous in what he does and in the choices that he makes. If it's fair for God to choose Isaac and to choose Jacob, then it's also fair and just for him to choose those who believe over those who do not believe regardless of their background. Then he quotes in verse 15 from Exodus 33. The exchanges between God and Moses is following the, the golden calf incident in that God will ultimately decide who he'll show mercy to. Desire and effort aren't the point. It's about God's sovereignty and deciding who he's going to be merciful to. And what we see ultimately, and as Paul has been building this case through Romans, he shows mercy to, he justifies those who put their faith in Jesus. He has chosen that it's those who are of faith who will be justified. But God doesn't owe anyone his mercy. But as we've been seeing throughout Romans, you know, he chooses to show mercy on those who put faith in Jesus. What we deserve, or rather what we're owed... Well, he talked about that over in chapter 6. The wages of sin is death. But God chooses on what basis he justifies and forgives. Now Paul goes back before the exodus, before they're leaving Egypt, and he talks about God using Pharaoh for his glory. Here in verses 17 and 18, God used Pharaoh to demonstrate his power and proclaim his name. God has mercy on whom he desires. He hardens whom he desires. Now it's important because one of the difficulties that people have with this account of Pharaoh is it says there are a number of times that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's important to note here, and we're not going to get into a lengthy discussion of Pharaoh, but just because that is a, a point of contention sometimes in this passage, that God doesn't harden anyone who hasn't first hardened their own heart. You look at the Exodus account, and the first several times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then after several times there of Pharaoh making that choice, then it changes to God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so, uh, an important distinction to make. But the example again shows God's sovereignty and His right to choose and how He deals with people. 
And so what we're seeing, and, and this is kind of an odd spot for us to cut it off, but we're just about out of time. What we're seeing here is, is Paul is building the case of God's sovereignty and showing that as God has chosen some, he has the right to choose who he will justify. And he's going to reason that to a conclusion as we continue in further through chapter 9 next week and see on what basis does God make that decision. Why is it he's going to ask, you know, towards the end of chapter 9, just to kind of summarize where this is headed. Chapter 9 and verse 30. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who didn't pursue, a, pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, didn't arrive at that law. Why? Because they were pursuing it on the wrong basis. The Gentiles, when you look at their background, they weren't pursuing righteousness at all. You see the paganism, you see all the immorality, you see all the problems there. And he said, but they arrived at righteousness. Why? Because when they heard the preaching of Christ, they were convicted and they put faith in Jesus. They changed. But the Israelites, although they were pursuing righteousness, they were doing it on the basis of law, they didn't arrive at it. Why? Because they were trusting themselves and their law keeping and they were trying to be righteous in and of themselves rather than trusting in Jesus. That's where all of this is headed. Now it's kind of a, it's a complicated argument that Paul makes to get there, but that's where this is headed and that's the point. And so I got a couple of comments before we finish up. Uh, Bill? Looking at this from a little bit different perspective, around this time, right, the, the, the Jews had been dispersed from the Roman provinces and, um, and about this time they're coming back and integrating with Roman Christians or Gentile Christians, right? And I, I, it makes me think about how important leadership is in a congregation. I try to put us in the same boat as them and not to cast any dispersion any way, shape, or form, but it'd be like us merging with a Catholic congregation, two vastly different points of view, two vastly different thought processes, but somebody like yourself up there trying to give a message and you'd have half the congregation going, uh-uh, and the other half going, yeah, it'd, it'd just be a fight. So leadership is vastly important, and I appreciate Paul coming in here to help this out and set everybody straight. Well, as you mentioned, the background of this letter deals with when the, the Jewish Christians were allowed to come back to Rome after Claudius, Claudius's edict had expired when he had uh, forced all the Jews to leave Rome, which would include Christians with a Jewish background. And so they had all been forced out of Rome. Now they've come back. And as, as Bill mentions, that's kind of the background, uh, historical background of this letter and why there is such a Jew-Gentile issue that he's addressing. Christian? Um, when you mentioned the Pharaoh and the hardening of the heart, I was kind of brought back to Trent's point on predestination and how there, there's no such thing. Um, most people misunderstand the hardening of the heart of the Pharaoh because they don't understand the Hebrew, which is Hazak. I probably just butchered that pronunciation, but it means to strengthen. He gave Pharaoh the strength to put up with one of the most devastating things that could possibly happen to a nation, and he kept Egypt together during the time. But more importantly, he never took the choice from him. And that's what the Jews entirely and fundamentally misunderstood and why Paul needed to write this letter, which was that they weren't choosing God. They were following a checklist. They thought, okay, I'm a Jew. I have my lineage this way, therefore I'm saved. Mm -hmm. And Paul had to remind them that it is entirely within God's autonomy to say who his people are and not have to honor an arbitrary listing by man, where in which they had fallen away and decided that they were no longer under his law, but rather their own rule just like that when the kings had been a portion of their lives or anything else. Yeah. Well, and that's the point he's been making all the way through here, talking about the, the problems with legalism. It doesn't save anyone. The law, if you're keeping that as a system in order to be saved, I can obey good enough or I can avoid sin good enough in order to be saved. Legalism doesn't save anyone. It's about the heart. And it gets back to who are you trusting to save you? Yeah. And so we're going we're gonna to stop there and we'll pick up next week. Uh, about halfway through chapter 9 and try to uh, finish out this chapter next week. Would you bow with me? We'll finish with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for the time that we've had to discuss your word, Father, and to, uh, and to see the sovereignty that you have and, and making the choices that you have, Father. And I pray that that would strengthen our faith, Father, that we would understand that what you're looking for is the heart. You're looking for those who will trust you and ultimately, as a result, will obey you. And Father, I pray that we would, that we would be that kind of people, that we would live at your word,
because of our love and trust for you. Father, I pray that you would continue to go with us throughout this morning in our time together. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.